Good evening and welcome to the Rick Steves Tours Festival of Europe. My name is Julianne Worden and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick and our special guest Robin Stencil. And now we already have about three and a half thousand households joining us tonight with more trickling in and it is my pleasure to introduce one of our tour guides this evening, Rick Steves. Hi Rick. Julianne, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who's tuning in. We're just having a lot of fun. This is a kind of a new tradition, I would imagine, in January. Every night for 22 nights in a row, we're giving together, inviting all of our traveling friends and celebrating Europe. And tonight, the theme is Switzerland. So thank you so much for joining us. You know, I've been talking to so many people who've been basically shut down for a couple of years, and now they're ready to get back into the saddle and traveling again. So we've got a lifetime of travel thrills ahead of us, and we're just really thankful and honored to be your travel buddies, to be your globetrotting guinea pigs, to be able to go over there and figure out what's best for your limited vacation vacation times. We Americans have the shortest vacations in the rich world, by the way, so we got to use our time smartly. And we'll get together every night until the end of the month at six o'clock Seattle time, nine o'clock on the East Coast to share our lessons, to share our experiences, and to help you enjoy maximum travel thrills for every mile, minute, and dollar. And if we can be part of that equation, we are thankful for that. Right? We're going to Switzerland. So I decided to something really creative, some hot chocolate and uh, yeah, that's what you have after a nice day of hiking when you come back to your chalet. And if you want to get fancy, you can uh, splash in a little bit of schnapps, all sorts of different flavors. I'm going to go with my peppermint schnapps here, a little bit more. <laughs> and we call that a, a Heidi Coco where I hang out in the Alps. And uh, that just makes sure that you are warm as you contemplate the great alpine thrills you enjoyed that day. Hey, I'm going to go right into our slides here and get going with our show. Again, I want to thank you for joining us. And right here, we've got a reminder that this is a tradition at Rick Steves Europe. We've been doing our tours for 40 years. For 30 years, we invited people every January, this time of year, into our little town north of Seattle, and we'd have five massive parties. A couple thousand people would join us, uh, all of them tour alums, people who enjoyed traveling with us that last year. And we would have so much fun getting the groups together. There's a group with their Swiss flags. They must have been alums from one of our Switzerland tours. And uh, today we're going to be having a virtual alumni party. That's what this is all about. 22 nights in January, every night from now until January 30th, we're doing a virtual version of what we always do in person. We're getting together, we're highlighting our guides, we're sharing our ideas about how you can best explore Europe. Now, of course, we've got a lot of tour seats to sell and we'd love to sell you one of the seats on our tours. But this event every night is about more than selling our tour program. We are just excited to equip you with good information so you can be your own tour guide if you like. And we've written about 50 guidebooks covering all of Europe. And if you're excited about what we're sharing right now, hey, you can just get some ideas from this, equip yourself with a good guidebook, expect yourself to travel smart and be your own guide. That is a good option. The main thing is we don't want no bland travel around here. You owe it to yourself, you owe it to your loved ones to take the planning part of your trip seriously and you'll have an exciting trip rather than planned <laughs> travel. This is a little tour company in Gibraltar, by the way, in Spain, apparently run by Mr. Bland, who didn't have much of a, a sense of what would be a good title for his company. Uh, we've got a, about 150 guides, mostly from Europe, that are just, I'm so proud of our guides. I'm so, so thankful for our guides. You'll be meeting them each night over the next couple of weeks. And today we are in Switzerland. This is our schedule. We got Switzerland today. By the way, all of the events that we've done in the last week, they're recorded. And you can watch them on our website at ricksteves.com. All of these will end up in the archive, the same place you go to sign up for the tours, just like our Monday night travel program. By the way, Monday night travel is something we've been doing ever since COVID hit. We are having our 100th episode of Monday night travel coming up the first Monday in February. And over this month, every Monday, we'll have a special episode. And uh, coming up uh, next Monday is an irreverent history of Rick Steves Europe tours. Um, a Monday after that, it's going to be the ethics of travel, including travel traveling in a warming world and how we should consider global climate change as we plan our trips. 
And on January 30th, it's our grand finale. So keep all of those dates in mind. And um, I also want to remind you that every Monday, we're going to be digitally drawing a name out of a digital basket. And one family from everybody who watched our shows or who dropped in or put their name in the basket over the week before will win a free tour, a Rick Steves one week tour to my four favorite cities, your choice, London, Paris, Rome, or Istanbul. And uh, that drawing will be held every Monday for the next three Mondays. For more on that, you can go to our website and remember 24 hours from now, you'll receive an email that explains all of this with links and so on. So you'll have your answers, uh, your questions answered that way. Also, I want to remind you to make this festival a little more festive. We're offering a $100 per seat discount on any tour booked this month. You see the promo code there. And if you sign up, that's yours as a little thank you if you do it as part of this travel festival. As I said, our focus today is Switzerland. I do want to stress our Switzerland tours are almost sold out for this year. We'll be doing them again in in uh, 2024, of course. You can get on the wait list this year. But anybody can pick up the guidebook and turn their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality. I've been doing that uh, for the last few years. And um, just on my own, I love to vacation in Switzerland. Here's what we call our spaghetti map. And it shows all of the routes, 40 different itineraries around Europe. And uh, for, oh, this, I think this picture was taken probably 40 years ago, if you can imagine that. And it's one of our earlier tour groups. And I vividly remember being with them on top of the Sheltorn and we hiked down that day. It was a beautiful day. We've been enjoying this kind of travel fun ever since. This was just a couple of years ago. And I happened to be enjoying uh, our My Way Alps tour. And here we are on a sunny day high in the Swiss Alps. As I mentioned, for the last few years, I've even been going to Europe just Switzerland just for kicks. It's my choice for a vacation. And uh, I grabbed three friends and we hiked around Mount Blanc. That was an incredible trip. We don't do any long distance hikes on our tours, but anybody can do that. And I'll tell you, that's a great way to, to, to give a little extra amp up the alpine thrills in your travels. Uh, plenty of information about all of this kind of travel on our website with our lectures, with our TV shows, and in our tour section, you can look at our itineraries and see what we think is smart for travelers. Well, what I'd like to do right now is to join our, or welcome our guest guide for the evening, Robin Stencil. And Robin, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and grüzi mitnan to everyone watching us. Grüzi, that's a, a good example right there, uh, as the tour guide would teach. Of course, what, 50% of, 60% uh, of Switzerland speaks German, but it's a Swiss German, isn't it, Robin? It's a little bit different, yep. But if you speak German, it'll be just fine when you're talking with the Swiss people. Exactly, yes. Hey, Robin, you are more than a tour guide. You are on in our tour operations department. Can you just tell us a little bit what your responsibilities have been over the last few years? At Rick yeah, Steve's sure. Europe? Sure thing, yeah. So the last uh, 10 years I've been working in the tour operations department and I've done just about every itinerary from the planning side of things. And most recently I was what we had, a, um, I was a, a, pro, a product manager, which really made sure that every itinerary we had, whether it was Portugal or Greece or Britain or Ireland, if you were going on a Rick Steves tour, you were going to have a similar experience with the greatest thrills possible. Mm. And when I think that we have a thousand tours a year, when I think that on the busy times in spring and fall, we have a hundred buses on the road in a single day at the same time, somehow you guys get it all figured out and every hotel, every bus connection, every meal, every guide, every local guide is figured out and it goes remarkably smoothly. You guys do a wonderful job and I'm particularly thankful for the work you've done in helping us uh, put together our very popular Switzerland itinerary that we're going to be looking at right now. So I guess you must uh, enjoy Switzerland uh, a little extra. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you, I like to go there whenever I can, get up high uh, in the Alps. All right, well, let's get high in the Alps for right now. And what I'd like to do, Robin, is check out this itinerary. And why don't you take just a minute? Uh, we're going to look at this um, over the next hour. 
But can you talk, we're going to fly into Lucerne, we're going to fly in and out of Zurich, most likely, because Switzerland is such a well-organized country from an infrastructure point of view. You can get to Zurich in probably an hour from any of the other major cities, and the train, most likely, even the express train stops right at the airport. But we fly into uh, Zurich, we start in Lucerne, and we loop around uh, clockwise, finishing in the capital city of Bern. Take us on a quick swim, swing through this itinerary so we know what we're going to be looking at. You betcha. That's exactly right. Well, we start off in Lucerne, which was the grand highlight on a lot of the um, the 18th, 19th century su super Europe tours. And what this tour really does is it, it gives us an experience in all three of the German, Italian and French parts of Switzerland. So we go from Lucerne to the very country uh, storybook area of Appenzell, down to the uh, the Italian Lugano, through Zermatt, the most notable mountain possibly in all of Switzerland, over to the French area in Lausanne, and then into the Berner Oberland, our favorite valley up in the uh, Alpine high mountain village of Muren, and then we end with two nights in the capital of Bern. You know, that's a beautiful sort of, I like the way it's a mix of cities and mountains and lakes, and there's so much variety in that little country of Switzerland. Uh, when you think of variety, think of four different language groups in that one small country, uh, French, German, Italian, and that little enclave up high in the mountains of uh, a Latin language directly related to Roman Latin called, what is it called, Romanche? Romanche, that's it. And less than 4% of the people in Switzerland speak it, so you probably won't run into that many of them. Well, that's good, because I don't even know how to say hello in Romanche. <laughs> hey, um, Robin, we're starting off in Lucerne, and uh, a lot of people just think mountains when they think Switzerland, but I think there's a lot of urban delights. And Lucerne has this wonderful historic wooden bridge, and uh, it's sort of um, the, the sort of the, the the major experience, really, when you're on that bridge, is to enjoy the beautiful art that you find painted right under the eaves. Yeah, and that art tells the the story, the historical version of the city of Lucerne from its founding up until the 17th or 18th century. And what's also really interesting, Rick, is that all all along Switzerland, wherever you find lakes or rivers, you're going to find a gorgeous, bustling riverside promenade with lots of restaurants to eat at. And that's really one, where you're going to want to belly up and spend your time. So, and there we got it right there. I, a beautiful lakefront with, a, you know, steam, a romantic old steamer, you know, tour boats that take you up and down the river to nearby towns and beautiful trails along the lakes. Uh, it's quite a delightful, you can see why so many people, you know, dream about living in Switzerland. So here we have a wide shot of Lucerne. And there we have one of these romantic old world steamers. And we can hop on that steamer. And I want to stress, we're going to be talking now uh, with all of our travelers that are joining us. Uh, we're talking generally about Switzerland. The lion's share, 90% of what we're talking about, we do on the tours, or you can do on the tours. Uh, but some of it, uh, you know, it's just Switzerland on another trip or something. So, but uh, a very popular thing to do in Lucerne is to catch one of these uh, uh, steamers, enjoy the lake scenery. And when we travel around Switzerland, if you look at these little charming barns in the fields, believe it or not, many of them are nothing but a camouflaged gun post with a big cannon, big artillery that protect, you can tell I'm not a military guy. I don't even know the terminology for this stuff, but I do know these are big guns and they protect that valley from invasions. And uh, Switzerland is a pretty serious uh, fortified mountain um, uh, citadel when you, when you know where to look. And what do we do on our tours, Robin? Well, we get the we get to do something really interesting. We get to actually visit one of these decommissioned bunkers in the in Switzerland, right on the uh, the the shores of Lake Lucerne. And this one is called Festenfurgen. And what's interesting, Rick, even about that photo of the the gun sticking out of the barn, you would never know as you drive along or riding along on the trains that even as Switzerland was neutral. They were ready to be defending their country if needs be. And you can see uh, when you have these tours and when people point it out to you, then as you're driving along, you can see the signs and you can see, oh, I bet that's another place where they're hiding a gun. In fact, that looks like wood there, but it's all concrete. It's a reinforced concrete painted to look like wood. And my Swiss friends tell me even the locals don't know for sure where all the guns are, but they do know that every bridge and every tunnel 
is already wired to be blown up. If there's ever an invasion and they needed to turn their uh, country into a fortress, they could push a button and blow up all of the entrances to that country. Uh, but generally, that's enough military stuff. This is the beautiful countryside, and this looks to me like that traditional romantic eastern part of Switzerland, the most uh, conservative and old-fashioned part of Switzerland, Appenzell. Exactly. This is storybook, fairy tale, traditional Switzerland at its best. And Appenzell town is the, this is the capital of Appenzell, the canton, where you're going to see these old traditional houses painted with bright colors. And if you're lucky enough to be there at certain times of the year, you might see some something really interesting, Rick. What would that be? Ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> Sometimes the locals don't even know when the cows are going to be going up to the mountain or down back down into the pastures. But I can tell you one thing that they can hear them coming. And when they do, they all come out to celebrate and to see the cows. And then even at the, the younger level, the people really get into it. And so you've got little mini farmers that maybe aren't ready to take the cows down. But instead, they get to have their own own herd of goats that they get to bring down. Oh, it is so beautiful. The, the, the cows and the goats are all dressed up. And so are the goat herders and their families and the little kids who are learning what their mom and dad do. And it's just such a charming look at traditional Switzerland. I believe I was in Appenzell one day when I was just doing my work for the guidebook. And um, all of a sudden, there's commotion. And the people in the shops abandoned their shops. All the shoppers abandoned their chores. And they ran out and they cheered as the cows ding-donged through the town. It was a festive day. And... Uh, there you got uh, the, the kids that are joining in on part of the beautiful traditional festivities. I love this little place we go to above Appenzell. Tell us about Ebenalp. Yeah, we visit Ebenalp as a, as a day trip from Appenzell. And this is a, Switzerland is such a great place to commune with nature, get in touch with your own spirituality, whatever it may be. And in this case, we take a pilgrimage up to this, uh, to Ebenalp, where it was an uh, old monastery. This is where pilgrims would come and they would have a respite and they would try to find solace and find their own spirituality. And they've turned that, uh, that old uh, monastery into, well, really it was a boarding house for the pilgrims who would go up and, and visit the, um, the church. But now you can go enjoy it on a sunny day. You can have a drink. You can mm. actually spend the night up there. Uh, we don't take our groups up there to sleep, but definitely as an independent traveler, you can book a room overnight and have this gorgeous, magical setting for just for yourself. And this is a case where we kind of cheat. We ride the lift up there. The pilgrims and the monks didn't have lifts when that was built, but now we can ride the lift and it's about a 10 minute hike above the chalet here. And then we can walk down and you walk through a cave and you actually find the cave where the hermit monk uh, uh, was uh, um, uh, living and, and worshiping and meditating and so on. And it's a little church to this day. And so many people are going there just to commune with nature these days. And what a delightful little perch and a wonderful slice of Swiss culture. Another slice of Swiss culture is the 10% of that society that is Italian. There's a region uh, in the south of Switzerland called Ticino, where people speak Italian. And where do we visit in, in uh, Italian speaking Switzerland? Well, well, really, we go up and over the Goddard Pass, which is a really important road and leads into the fortified town of Bellinzona. And this is where we get our first glimpse of the Italian side of the Alps or what the Swiss call the sunny side of the Alps. This is the, the canton of Ticino. And you can see already it's got a very Italian feel to it. And we stop here for lunch break. It's a great place to have a picnic. Really where we're going, where we're headed is the lakeside villa of Lugano. Yeah. And now this is the posh kind of chic, very um, ritzy place that you would go and promenade along the lake. Uh, there's plenty of opportunities to get out on the water. This though, Rick, this is the place where you're just going to stop and relax. Mm. Then you're going to kind of have a vacation from your vacation. You again, get to take a gondola or a lift up to one of the surrounding mountains, Monte Bray or San Salvatore. We like Monte Bray because you get to take that gondola up and then you can hike back down to this gorgeous lakeside town called Gandria. Mm. And from Gandria, you can actually take the boat back into Lugano or you can walk back into Lugano through these olive groves or you can eat up top uh, at the top of Monte Bray or San Salvatore, the, the Tichinese cuisine. And there are these uh, lakeside and hidden grottos that serve hearty polentas and, and cured meats and fish. And this is just something you want to do it toward the end of your day. 
You know, Robin, as you're talking, it just occurred to me, I am such a lucky guy to, to, <laughs> to, to own a business that I love our mission. I love what we produce. And I'm so thankful and proud of the my colleagues, 100 people just like you, passionate about Europe. And um, it blows me away that I'm so relaxed about the quality of our tours because they're in great hands with caring guides like you who really, it's an all year long job. You've got a lot of people that work with you to make sure these itineraries are, are, are well organized and we take advantage of, of every minute of our traveler's time to the greatest. And just to think how artfully you've woven in a little bit of Italian Switzerland into the Swiss uh, tour, to me is great. So thank you and uh, to all of your colleagues in our tour operations department for that. I know we have a long drive. It's just basically a scenic drive. It's just a delightful day from the Italian speaking part of Switzerland all the way to Lake Geneva. And you got to get an early start and you'll get in a little late because the major stop in the middle of that day is a chance to see the Matterhorn. The quintessential mountain chalet town of Zermatt to be to be sure. And if you're just lucky enough, the mountain will come out for you. Even if it doesn't, it's a great town to just be a tourist and get involved and see the old chalets. You can go into the old town and see the, the traditional wooden houses. But really, on a spectacular day like this, we're going to get you up into the mountains and you get to see that iconic Matterhorn. And nothing puts me in a good mood like having the sunshine out when I'm in Zermatt in order to see the Matterhorn. Look at that, that beautiful mountain there, huh? It's gorgeous. It took me three trips. Did you know that, Robin, to finally see the Matterhorn? Two times I went all the way down there. You can't even drive to Zermatt. You got to park your car or in our case, your tour bus and hop on a train and get down there. And then it's a delightful little, you know, chalet town. There's more hotels than there are people's residents, I would imagine. And it's just sort of your fairy tale Swiss Alpine resort. And when the sun comes out, look at that. It's such a beautiful lift. I are a beautiful uh, mountain. And I understand they've spent half a billion dollars upgrading all of their lifts because it's a great destination in the winter, a great destination in the summer. And I do want to remind people, if you want more information on all of this, we're having to really hustle when we give our presentations during this festival, but we've got TV shows and we've got lectures and we've got all sorts of audio tours and so on. If you go to ricksteves.com, I was here filming and I was really happy because we the camera was rolling and we had the Matterhorn to show off. But you can ride a lift up to beautiful Alpine Lake and hike with this beautiful drop backdrop and uh, and with our tours you can trust that our guides like robin have sussed out all the options and they know you've got one day and you're going to have the very best day to check out and enjoy zermatt and the matterhorn before heading on in to lake geneva lac le Mans. things in switzerland often have two different names don't they they do especially in this region where it's very french and I would say of all of the regions in Switzerland, this is a place where you're really going to want to put those language skills to the test. You're going to want to practice your bonjours and merci's here because they will that will take you far. And uh, you can already tell you, OK, we've gone from the mountainous, the chalets, the Italian and now, Rick, we're in the French part of Switzerland and they take some things seriously here. And you know what they take most seriously? The food. The food. All right. Yes. So well, you've got these plans. great markets. And if you're there, lucky enough to be there on a market day, this is what you do. You go buy your vegetables, you go buy your fruits, you make a gorgeous picnic, and then you can just spend the rest of the day exploring the old town or going down to the Olympic Museum on the waterfront to the Wishi neighborhood. That's the lakefront kind of fancy area, the new town of Lausanne, where they do have the Olympic Museum. And more importantly, if you're a if you're an Olympics fan, you should definitely take a day, half a day, couple hours, check that out. It's the perfect thing to do before hopping on that classic steamboat that's going to take you out on Lake Geneva. What a delight! And I mean, it's uh, <laughs> I just Switzerland has so much more than the famous mountains and these lakes are so charming and then of course if you're going on the lakes you'll want to get off the boat at a famous chateau what do we have here chateau chian that's exactly right and there's no better way to approach it than from the water it's absolutely majestic when you get off the the castle is actually built shutting out into the lake it's almost like a sand castle it's really a cool way to approach it yeah and this looks like a group that's having a good time you know one thing i love about taking a tour we are all independent travelers at at, at heart but 
taking these, designing these tours, we're able to capitalize on the efficiency and the economy of group travel, like having a, a, a bus driver and a big bus to get us around and having all of the schedules figured out in advance and the reservations made and the hotels figured out and having experience to know which restaurants and which local guides are best. We can grab all of that, design it in, and then people, sure you spend a little more money per day on a tour, but I would think very conservatively, you experience 50% more every day, 50% more memories, and none of the stress and none of the headaches uh, of, of going on your own. So even for an independent type spirit, these tours can make a lot of sense. And I'm talking about an organized tour anywhere from a good tour company anywhere. For instance, on this day, we leave uh, from Lausanne, and we may have had a chance to visit the Olympic Museum on the way to the boat, but your guide would know what's possible and what's smart that day. Then you hop on the boat, you get off the boat here, you'd see the chateau, and I would imagine the bus is waiting for you here. The bus deadheaded from Lausanne, the length of the lake, meets us there. We see the chateau. We read Lord Byron's poem when he was imprisoned in that dank dungeon, and then where do we drive with our bus? Well, you're exactly right. So this is the beauty of how this day was planned. You've got a full day on the lake and in the castle. And what better way to wind down than in the vineyards? And we stop here in the Lavo region and we have a family one run winery where we get to learn all about Swiss wine. We get to go through the vineyards and then we get to, of course, taste because that's the most important part. <laughs> you know, and Swiss wine, I... The best budget deal going in Switzerland, I think, is the Swiss beer, because you can get a beer for a great price, and it's a huge bottle, and you can share it with your travel partner, if you like, and that certainly does not break the bank. The Swiss wine is a little more expensive than what you'd expect in France or Italy, but it's really good, and you ask yourself, why does nobody know about this stuff? And I think it's because they don't uh, produce a lot of it. And what they do produce, they pretty much drink themselves or use for their local uh, hospitality industry. That's right. They don't export a lot, but when you're there and you know what to look for, and they're in Ticino, you want to look for the white Merlot, Rick. It's oh. a specialty of Ticino. It's Merlot grape made in the white wine style. And here in Lavo, in the French area, we're looking for something called Chasselet white wine that's just beautifully crisp and perfect for a warm summer day. Crisp, I think that's the word. A nice white crisp, a crisp white wine in the French speaking part of Switzerland. What do you say again when you step into a shop? Oh, in, in the French part, you would say bonjour. You always want to start with a nice greeting like that in the shops. Robin, I knew the, I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear you sing <laughs> like that because that's it just makes you happy. And in French, in French Switzerland or in France, it is sort of a, a song, isn't it? Bonjour. Very Lilton, yes, Bonjour, exactly. Bonjour, au revoir, merci. It's such a delight. And exactly. I, and and Rick, now we've got a great segue. We're in, we've had some wine, we're speaking French, and what goes better with wine than the other ex the thing that they do export in Switzerland along with chocolate? Cheese. Cheese. Look at that. And and uh, you know, if you like cheese, you like Gruyere. You know that word Gruyere. This is a town called what? Gruyere. <laughs> yes. Here. And we do stop here on our tour. Uh, and if you aren't on our tour, you can also make a stop here and you can have some fondue in Gruyere, the birthplace mm. of the Gruyere fondue. Um, we actually, we stop there just briefly because we have an appointment to make. We have to go up to a little family run farm on the Yawan Pass and we get to see all the all their farm and everything about making cheese everything that uh, goes into their making cheese and rick do you know how alpcase started uh a farmer bumped an udder and <laughs> milk fell out it landed in his boot it got rotten and he came back the next week and he goes hmm that's pretty good <laughs> I hope that's not the story. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Actually, no, did, it's not that did... far off, though, because when the cows are up in the pasture, they have to be milked. Oh, yeah. But the farmers realized that it was a lot easier to carry cheese down than to carry all the milk down. So oh, this is kind of it. how Alpcaza and Al Alpcaza, Alp cheese, is made from the milk from when the cows are up on the Alp. 
And these are the heroes of that whole process. And uh, it is, it's for real. When you travel almost anywhere in Alpine, Switzerland, you'll see the cows and it's a part of the economy. The government, I understand the government subsidizes it because the government wants to keep the traditional economy alive. But a local Swiss person told me they know which valley the cows ate the grass according to what flowers were most prominent there when it comes to creating the milk that created the cheese when they eat the cheese a year after it was the grass was eaten or however long that process is the swiss are so into cheese and i love to be a cultural chameleon in my travels and if the locals are into cheese i'm going to be into cheese too yeah, that's exactly correct. There are cheese mongers, Rick, cheese mongers who have that job. I would love to have that job. I love stinky cheese. The older, the better. Hey, now we're going into the Berner Oberland, or you might see it called the Bernice Oberland, depending on if you're using French or German. But uh, the famous uh, center of that area is Interlaken. And we're talking about this in a little more depth, uh, Robin, because we have one Switzerland tour, but you were reminding me earlier today, we have four or five itineraries that go through Switzerland. And we always, if we're going to take one stop in Switzerland, it's going to be the Berner Oberland. And everybody knows the name Interlaken, literally the, the spot between the two lakes, as you see here. And if you look south from here, you see two valleys going out. On the left is the famous and touristy Grindelwald Valley. On the right is the uh, more backdoor, more intimate, less commercial Lauterbrunnen Valley. We make Lauterbrunnen Valley our home. We sleep in three or four different villages in that valley. I was just there for a, a six day vacation, Robin, a couple of months ago uh, with my girlfriend. And we had a three day uh, a home base and did hiking from there. And then we went and, and laced three mountain hotels together, hiking all across that region from the far right to the far left. And I tell you, that was one of the most beautiful uh, weeks I've ever had and in my travels, and it was completely done on our own. And I'd like to remind people, there's some beautiful opportunities for long distance hiking that does not lend itself to organized tourism, like we're, um, we're talking about with our tour program, but that's something anybody can do. And if you're curious about that, well, that's a good example. There's a whole hour presentation I made on hiking in the Swiss Alps from my experience doing just that for my personal vacations in the last two years. And you'd find that on our website. In particular, that would be one of the hundred shows that are archived in our Monday night travel series. And you just got to dig into our website to find these, I think, very practical and helpful sources of information for travelers. Well, let's go deeper into the Berner Oberland. Here we see the town of Interlaken. And if you were to go straight ahead, you'd go down this valley. And I just I just did, you know, I, I rented a bike in Lauterbrunn in there, Robin, and I went up to the very head of the valley and then got to coast all the way down to Interlock. And it was a beautiful, beautiful day before we started our hiking experiences. But right here in Lauterbrunn Valley, we have the town of Lauterbrunn. A lot of our groups stay there. And uh, Ben and I were doing a tour a few years ago. Uh, this was, uh, that's Ben there, one of our tour guides. And uh, he's a colleague of here in our tour operations department. And uh, that was our My Way Alps tour. And I want to stress that, uh, as I mentioned, serious hiking does not lend itself to organized travel. My Way Alps tour does lend itself to serious hiking. Uh, it's $1,000 less for a typical itinerary. And it's just the accommodations, the breakfasts, and the bus connections. And you get an, a, um, a guide, but he's really, the guide is, is really just a, a consultant that will have office hours in the morning to make sure you know what to do during the day and you're on your own. You get the bones of the tour, but the freedom and the economy of doing it without all of the included events and organized activities. But I, I spent the day with Ben hiking with our group and it was just glorious. Uh, we hiked down, down on the North Face Trail, actually walking behind the Spritz Waterfall. Uh, on the way down, I uh, had a close encounter with a falling tree. Actually, it was just kind of clowning around, but uh, it was a beautiful hike. And then we came into our home base of Gimmelwald from above. And you can hear this, you can see the steep fields. I said you could hear. It's, it, I always love the thought of coming in here and hearing the bees doing their busy work, um, poll pollinating all the flowers, and then seeing the cows munching on those flowers, and then dropping into one of those chalets down there and buying cheese directly from the family 
that makes it. But this is our village, my favorite village, Gimmelwald. And we don't sleep there with our groups, but it's a very easy um, neighboring village that we can go visit. And here we see the traditional economy in action. This is where you just, you cut the hay, you feed the cows, you milk the cows, you make the cheese, you sell the cheese, and then you cut more hay. That's what they do in this town. There's just uh, like, there's everybody has one of two last names in this little village. There's a single room uh, schoolhouse. It is just the most pristine, quintessential old world bit of Switzerland. And this is the Switzerland we'll experience. Uh, you know, the, the, the people there, they work the farms in the summer and they work the ski lifts in the winter. And uh, people look like they're typecast for some, you know, troll movie in the high in the mountains. And this is the bigger town above Gimmelwald called Murin. A lot of our groups stay in Murin. And it's a beautiful town that has everything you need to know. And behind us there in the distance, we see the north face of the Eiger above us, towering above us. We got the Eiger, the Monk, and the Jungfrau. And after a beautiful day of hiking, what's waiting for us at our hotel? Well, we definitely have to have fondue after hiking. In fact, I heard once that it's absolutely sacrilegious to go on a hike without a chocolate bar, but maybe the second sin after that is to not have a big pot of fondue waiting for you. I love it. I just absolutely love it. And that's part of our experience. You know, there's something just delightful, isn't there, about being in rural, traditional, small town Switzerland. And I think, Rick, really what we're trying to say with this is that if, if you have limited time, whether you're on a tour or whether you're going by yourself, this is really the place where you need to make sure you're spending time, right? You need to set aside at least a couple of days to be here. Yeah, that's so true. And you got to take a moment just to be there when the sun is 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 uh, setting behind the mountains or for me even more beautiful when the moon is rising behind the mountains they, or, you know they call this the golden hour this is a real thing and it's you can see it coming and see it coming and see it coming and then all of a sudden uh, it erupts and the thing that you want is to be on your porch with a glass of wine right at that golden hour there's nothing better you know you can come home with souvenirs you can buy things in stores but this is this is what you're really coming home with you you nailed it you're so right you know i'm in europe for a month or six weeks at a time i honestly never turn on the tv in my hotel room it's just the first thing i do when i get in a hotel room is i i tuck away the remote i don't the last thing i want to do is disturb myself by you know, being back at home and watching the, the TV. I want to be in the balcony watching the lights change on the mountain. I want to be taking a little walk after dinner. I want to be hearing the the, the bees in, in the flowers rustling there with the cows. And uh, it's just, I, I want to be dreaming about what I'm going to do next day on that lift. Here we have a good example of one of the lifts in the, in the summer, in the wintertime that is crowded with skiers, but in the summertime, it's crowded with all of us travelers. What's going on here with this lift? Well, we make a we have something really special on the Switzerland tour, which is we go up the first thing in the morning. We go to the top of the Schiltorn Mountain. That's our favorite mountain. And what we do up there is we get to have a breakfast at 10,000 feet. And it's a really cool experience because you're sitting down, you've got a 360 degree revolving restaurant and you're eating your breakfast, just waiting to go outside to see the views. But you, you know, you're starting the day off. I can't think of a better way to start the day. I knew I could go take a run to the kitchen and uh, top up my hot chocolate if I just turned you loose, Robin. Thank you for giving me a break. I'm enjoying my Heidi Coco. <laughs> you know, I don't even know if this is really called a Heidi Coco, but Walter, beloved Walter, he passed away just a year ago or so. But for 30 years, we brought our groups to Walter's Hotel, Hotel Mittaghorn in Gimmelwald. And Walter and I invited, <laughs> we invented this drink. I think we did. You know, everybody wants chocolate and hot chocolate and schnapps. We called it the Heidi Coco. A lot of it is how you know. Well, you it. can do it at breakfast here on the top of Shilthorn, and anyone can do that. That's just something that we include special for our groups. Again, independent travelers can do that. And really, whatever mountain you're going up, you want to make sure you go early in the morning because usually that's when it's clear up top. And yep. in the, if the clouds come in, they come in in the afternoon. I've been dilly dallying around at the top of the shell town. They're at 10,000 feet here enjoying their breakfast. Dilly dallying around before I got outside and enjoyed the views. And then I turned around and the clouds have come and all the mountains are gone. So you're right. You got to start early if you're on the ball and uh, be out there and enjoy the beautiful weather like this when you have it. Um, coming down from the Shiltorn, we have a stop called Berg, right? 
And uh, That's I think correct. Yeah. I'd like to get off the gondola there and miss one gondola and have half an hour to enjoy the, the little thrill walks they put in there for the travelers. Very family friendly, very exciting. And you can do that as you are enjoying this amazing Shiltorn experience. Also, you can do some serious, serious hiking and you don't need gear. You don't need a lot of time. Is that Berg down there in the in the? It in the is. Distance? You can see it in the, kind of the left side of the photo. That little right perching. There. Yeah, there you go, right there. That's the next uh, station down. You can actually hike down to it if you want to. So we were. These uh, women are up at ten thousand feet at Shiltorn, where we had breakfast in that revolving restaurant, and then they could ride the lift back down to Berg and hop out, and then do that thrill walk there. I like to get out at Berg and then take a nice loop long walk back down into Gimmelwald, but you have all sorts of options. And then you finally get back down to civilization. You get down to where people are living and working and where your hotel might be. This is an example of that North Face walk I was talking about. I just did that a couple months ago and uh, it just never gets old. It just, any time, boy, it's so beautiful. And you get back to your town, whether it's Murin, or Wengen, or Lauterbrunnen, or Steckelberg, or Gimmelwald, you get back home, you have a nice beer, and you talk with your friends about what a day you've had, and the sun is just beaming on your faces, and you're ready for tomorrow's activities. Every day is a lifelong memory. And there are so many different trails you can take. That was one example during the North Face. Earlier, you, you showed the valley floor. That's a very easy, relatively flat, paved downhill walk. This is another one, and it's spectacular as well. So if you're not really wanting to do high elevation gains or steep hills, you could just walk from Murin to Grootschop or Grootschop to Murin. And it's a lovely valley or a floor um, at elevation, but relatively flat gravel mm -hmm. path. And if you're lucky, you do get to come across some of those Alpine friends of ours. Yeah. And you know, you can ride the lift up and then walk on a ridge and ride the lift down. I That's don't have the a spectacular thing about Switzerland. What, get up high. The number one thing you want to do in Switzerland is get up high. And you don't have to do that by your own two feet if you don't want to. There are a million different ways you can do it. They are so ready to help you get up and hit new heights. You know, I just noticed it right now, but I do believe, I think, yeah. Now, maybe that's, that's probably Manlik in there, isn't it? I think so. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I went up a lift called uh, Schinnigeplatt, and I walked all the way along a ridge to first, and then I hiked back down. It was a seven-hour hike. It was a great thing. I, I just did it a couple months ago, uh, but it's the next ridge over. But the point is, I took the train way up here, and there's a mountain hotel from the set, from the 1800s up here. Uh, we stayed there, and then we walked on a ridge just like this, but even better, uh, for seven hours until we got to the far end. And then we caught the chairlift down and took the train back to Gimmelwald. And the point is, on your tour, you're just gonna be scratching the surface and you're gonna be uh, scribbling down ideas for the next time that you visit. Oh, Well, tell I mean, us that's about another the reason we go up so early to the... That's why we go so so early to the Shiltorn too, is because we give you the whole free day to do whatever kind of hike or adventure you wanna have afterwards. Right. And speaking of adventures, this is, you know, right there is the, the Jungfrau. And uh, if you take the lift up to Manlikin, I think that's what I was looking at there from that last view. You take the lift here. And then this trail goes around the little peak in the foreground. And ahead of you, you've got the Eiger, Monk, and Jungfrau, this most incredible alpine panorama anywhere. Of course, the Eiger is famous for uh, rock climbing. Uh, you can take the train all the way up to the Jungfrau Yoke, which is a mountain station right there, 12,000 feet above sea level. And you look south at the longest glacier in Europe. And then you take the train, which tunnels literally through this mountain all the way back down to here. You can hike around this mountain and you get a, a trail like this. And then you get to this station where you have a nice little break looking down at uh, Kleine Scheidig. That's where you catch the train to go up to that mountain station there. And that is the Jungfrau Yoke. Tell us about these amazing little um, little chalets you, you stumble into just when you are needing a little rest stop. That's exactly right. You know, you can actually hike all the way from Slovenia to France and stay up in the in the mountains the entire way and just spend your nights here in these mountain chalets. But we don't have enough time to do that. So what I like most, the thing that you have in common is that at every single one of these little mountain chalets, you're going to have a gorgeous 
uh, patio and to sit there in the sunshine and to meet new friends and talk about your experiences over a glass of beer and especially that fondue is just a spectacular way to enjoy your afternoon. Nice. You know, I was there filming a couple of years ago and uh, we arranged for this uh, local musician to meet us and uh, play the Alphorn as we filmed him. And when I met him, he said, Rick Steves, I am so happy to meet you. I've heard your name for 20 years because for 20 years I've been performing for your groups. And this is the first time I've ever met him. He's such a charming, beautiful gentleman. Do you know what his name is, Robin? Yes, that's the famous Bops. Bops. And he's just great. And tell us uh, about the kind of activities you would arrange from our tour operations department. Well, we would bring in Bops and he would play for us after our dinner at the hotel. And we would learn all about the Alphorn and what it was used for. And back in the day, we would even get to try it out for ourselves. Yeah. And it's kind of like if you have an embouchure to play a trumpet or a trombone, it's the same kind of mouthpiece. And then if you buzz higher and lower, you've got the harmonic overtone series. So an Alphorn will play C, G, C, E, G, C, just like a bugle. Uh, and uh, to hear him play it is just heavenly. And then to hear a tourist play it, well, sometimes you wish you could unhear that. <laughs> it's a good experience, isn't yes, it? Yes, it's soulful. It, yeah, yeah, yes, let's, when let's, books play, it's soulful. Right. And yeah. when the tour members play, it's something else. <laughs> well, you can imagine, you can imagine your son is up there at the, in the mountain uh, hut for two months. You haven't even seen him but he'll play his Alphorn in the morning to let you know everything is okay. Uh, you know, it's just a beautiful way of communicating that harkens back to that, those old olden times when uh, the culture was very, very uh, uh, small and intimate and in touch with that nature. Here we are again with another one of those cow experiences. We're at the top of Lauterbrunnen Valley. I'll never forget being there. I was with there with one of our tour groups. And this is just a couple years ago. We had had that beautiful hike coming down from Murin and, uh, behind the waterfall and all that. And we were all tired. I was just getting comfortable in the room. I took off my shoes and I was going to take a little break. And then I heard that distant sound of those cowbells. And I just thought, oh my goodness, this is the day the cows were coming down from the high alp. We all put our shoes on. We all ran down there and it was an unforgettable experience. Can you imagine that up at Steckelberg? I, I can. And, you know, this is cows are so vital to the community. This is not just put there for tourists. This is something that all of the locals respect so much. It's absolutely a vital, important and, and yep. a really special traditional thing to witness. It really is. And, you know, that's something that we experience all across Switzerland is that Alpine culture, that cow culture. I just love the way, uh, you know, uh, Swiss Swiss culture and nature mix it up so intimately and comfortably together. The capital of Switzerland is the city of Bern. And Bern is uh, an amazing design. It's on a peninsula within the tight bend of the Aro River. And this is where you have the parliament building and the cathedral and so much history from that town. And, and this is like the spine of the town with these beautiful painted fountains, the wonderful facades and the big town clock. I just love being in these kind of towns, uh, working on my guidebook, in fact, uh, I was just, that was a few years ago, I was going to get my guidebook to hold up tonight for our class, Robin, and it's all ripped up. I've got it rubber banded together from that experience, but I was just there last year checking out the cities and making sure this guidebook information is up to date. And I want to stress, even if you're not going to take a Rick Steves tour, these guidebooks are designed so you can do our tours without us. Grab one of these guidebooks. I don't care if it's Ireland or, or Greece or Portugal or Poland. You grab the guidebook and you've got what you need to do the tour without us. You can do it on your own. And of course, you'll be given this guidebook when you take the Rick Steves tour because our guides really want our travelers to do what we should do together, be well-organized, well-oriented, and then be given some free time so they can use their guidebook and visit what they want to do or hike where they want to hike on their free time. It's a, it's a beautiful mix of organized travel and independent adventure, isn't it, Robin? It really is. And I think the, the other thing that is important is this to make sure that you're spending enough time in these places, right? I mean, we design our tours to, to maximize time, but we also make sure that we've spent two nights in most of the places, just so you can be there at night, you can be there in the morning, and you can have a free day or a free afternoon to really do the thing that you want to do. 
Yeah, and if you look at our itineraries, and I would encourage people, a lot of people are watching us right now, Robin, that have no intention of taking a Rick Steves tour. I just think that's fine. They're independent travelers. They don't want to have a bus. They don't want to be sharing the experience with 25 people, and they'd rather be their own guides. Well, I think that they're the kind of people that are going to equip themselves with this guidebook, and it's all very doable if you have an up-to-date guidebook. And uh, I just love the thought that Europe is well-designed for travelers, and if you take the planning part seriously, if you equip yourself with good information, we keep no secrets. This guidebook originated. My guidebooks were originally called 22 Days in France and 22 Days in Britain because they were the handbook for 22-day tours. And now we've designed those guidebooks so people can do our tours without us. So wherever your travel dreams are taking you, you can do it. You can do it on your own or you can do it with a tour. I love to be in, in Bern when there's a, all over Switzerland. If you're on the ball, you'll hit some festivals. And um, I forget if I've told you about this, Robin, but I was in Bern doing my research and the whole city was overwhelmed with a buskers festival. These are the best street musicians in all of Europe that gathered together in Bern. Just yesterday, I was inter interviewing the uh, Susie Levine. She is the former uh, ambassador to Switzerland uh, from the United States uh, when President Obama was in office. And she had, it was so much fun talking to her. It'll be up on our radio show. We have a, a, a weekly hour on the radio and public radio. It airs on 500 stations. We're just uh, we're coming in on our 700th hour that we've produced over the last 15 years. But Susie was talking about, uh, I asked her if she'd ever been in, she worked in Bern for three years. I asked her if this busker festival was a, was a one-off thing or was it regular? And she said, no, every year they have the busker festival in Bern. And it is something to, to build your trip around if you like street music. I love, love, love the action. And I like eating in a nice restaurant in Bern. This is uh, downstairs in a, in a venerable old building, isn't it? It is. This is in the basement of the Cornhouse Keller, which is a fine dining restaurant that we eat at on the tour, and you can eat there as an independent traveler as well. I think, Rick, of all of the towns that we visited and we talked about tonight, perhaps Bern has the highest cuisine of all of Switzerland. Um, I mean, Lausanne has the French stuff, French cuisine going for it, but everywhere in Switzerland, you're going to get really hearty meals. Of course, you're going to have cheese, you're going to have chocolate, the great brown breads and the beautiful mm. breakfast. In in Bern though, you you have a chance to sample all kinds of different high cuisine. And and look at the venerable setting there. I mean you're in a in a very important piece of architecture, just a couple of blocks from the National Parliament building. Uh, you mentioned the beautiful brown bread. Drop into a bakery and you got a nice selection. Definitely. And then this again makes a perfect picnic, especially yeah. on a day when you know you're going to go for a hike. You bet, you know, and, and that's what I was doing with with uh, my girlfriend Shelly for a whole week is we would just drop by the bakery, we'd drop by the uh, co-op, and we'd put together a picnic. And when you eat that picnic halfway through a hike, it is fine dining, even if it's just a sandwich. And of course, Switzerland has some great beer. More importantly, Switzerland has some great conviviality. You'll enjoy that with people that you just get to know and Probably the most important and popular part of Swiss cuisine is uh, very sweet. The chocolate. Mm. Yes, this is a this is where my heart lies in Switzerland is with all the chocolate. And you mentioned co-op, and I I think that that is a great place to go. Co-op is the grocery store all over Switzerland, and you can go into co-op and spend. 15 minutes just on the chocolate aisle trying to decide what kind of chocolate bar you're going to take on your hike. <laughs> and of course, you, you've got the classic Toblerone. Of course, you have to have that. But uh, no, the best thing to do is just try all the different Swiss brands. And even if you think you can get Swiss chocolate here, it's not the same, Rick. It's like we were talking about with the cheese. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. chocolate in Switzerland from the cows with the milk and the water, it just tastes better. Get into it, get into it, buy Swiss chocolate, buy the, buy the uh, don't worry about paying a little extra for the finer quality. What is your best tip for Swiss chocolate? Oh, hands down, I say the brand Kaye. Grand Kaye. It's uh, the you... brand, the brand is called Kaye. Oh, Kaye, okay. Yes. How do you spell Kaye? Because that's kind of a French spelling, isn't it? It is, it's C-A-I-L-L-E-R, and it is down by Chateau Chillon. Chateau Chillon, there you go. Isn't it fun to, to like a certain brand of chocolate and to have been 
right there where it was made for the rest of your life. You'll have that F a good connection on it. Hey, let's review one more time the itinerary that we've shared with people. And then in a moment, we're going to have questions. So I'm so excited, Robin, that you're with us because you know Switzerland as well as anybody that I know. And uh, we'll have some Q&A from our uh, travelers in just a couple minutes. But we just basically reviewed the itinerary. In our judgment, this is the best 12 days that Switzerland has to offer. And um, take us through that one more time, just really quickly, please. You, you bet. So we start in the lovely lakeside Lucerne before we head east into the most traditional area of Appenzell. Then we journey south to another lake in, in the Italian part of Switzerland in, in Lugano. We take that amazing day trip and we cross our fingers that the Matterhorn's going to be out before landing on Lake Geneva in the French speaking area in Luzon. Then we head into the Berner Overland, the Lauterbrunnen Valley and our little cliffside village uh, hotel in Murren. And then we end in the heart and the capital of, of Switzerland in Bern for two nights. And I've got to remind people, you can be in Murin, you can be in Lauterbrunnen, you can be in Bern, you can be in Lucerne, and you can get to the airport in Zurich in about an hour, um, maybe an hour and a half if you're, or two hours if you're in Murin. But the point is, you can rely on the Swiss trains and they just go lickety split, a uh, couple of departures every hour to every corner of the country. It really is an easy country to fly in and out of. I also want to remind people when you take a Rick Steves tour, um, included in the tour is all the group sightseeing events at, at no extra cost. You've already paid for it. Most tour companies get you on board and then they sell you optional excursions. Well, there's no sale of optional excursions for us. If everybody does it and you're busy all the time with our group, it's included. You've already paid for it. You get a small group, not 50 people on a 50 seat bus but 24 to 28 people on a modern 50 seat bus. It's basically two seats for every person. Really important, you get the full-time services of a professional Rick Steves guide and local experts to uh, complement that guide services as you come to different stops along the way. We love to line up local guides to uh, be a guest guide, another voice, another friend while you're traveling in this or that country. Um, all the group transportation is included. Uh, the accommodations in memorable centrally located hotels. Memorable is a word that if I was worried about um, uh, rough edges, I'd be uh, paying attention to. Characteristic, you could call it. These are not modern, high-rise, American-style, international-class business hotels. These, in a lot of cases, are funky, characteristic, little mom-and-pop uh, chalets and guest houses. And for me, I would prefer that to the high rise, no soul, very predictable, very comfortable hotels, hands down. I love our accommodations. Robin and her colleagues do a great job of traveling in these towns and figuring out the best hotels for our needs. And these are hotels where you really are right downtown, you're right where you want to be, and you've got staff that really enjoys their work and wants to get to know you. Also, all the breakfast and half your dinners are included. And quite important, your tips are included. I really think that's a great thing, Robin, that we include tips on the itineraries. Uh, the guides and the drivers are well tipped, but our travelers do not need to worry about it. I also want to remind people that with our tour program, we, um, we give ourselves a self-imposed carbon tax for every person that takes our tour. It's $30, and we invest it in farmers in the developing world to help them do their work while contributing less to climate change. This is for real. We've spent $3 million in the last four years supporting 10 organizations in the developing world to help farmers do their work more productively and more climate smart. We're going to be talking about this a week from Monday when we dedicate a whole evening of our festival, that's January 23rd, to the ethics of travel. And the big, big elephant in the room, of course, is climate change and travel. When we travel, we contribute to climate change. Should we, we be flight shamed out of our travels? No. Should we pay the cost for our carbon to fly to Europe and back? If we are ethical, the answer is yes. We do it as a tour company. We don't charge you for it. We, uh, we include that in our tours. It's a cost of us doing business is to pay for your carbon to get to Europe and back. So that's just a fun and important extra that we're quite proud of. Also, I want to remind you that 
we're going to give away four tours during this festival every Monday for the next three Mondays, one next Monday, one Monday after that, and two on our finale evening. And we're going to digitally draw a name out of a digital bucket. And you can get your name in that bucket, one entry per family per week, I believe. And um, that's pretty good odds. And maybe you can win a tour. More information on that will be in the email that comes your way tomorrow. But you can sign up. I just did, just for kicks. Ha! <laughs> And it's so simple. It takes two minutes. Get your name in there. And then you may win a Rick Steves tour to London, Paris, Rome, or Istanbul. Those are our favorite big cities, seven-day tours. You'll have 100 departures to choose from if you win. Um, I do want to apologize in advance for the law. Canadians cannot gamble in America. Our government is concerned about gambling regulations, and understandably so. And for some reason, they can't have a giveaway work in Canada. So I just am so <laughs> I'm frustrated by that, but there's nothing we can do about it. Canadians, though, are more than welcome to sign up for our tour and save $100 per seat along with all the Americans, if you use our promo code. Until the end of the month, if you sign up on a Rick Steves tour, you will get a discount. I want to remind you, there are a lot of tours still available. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Italy. Not next week, tomorrow, we're going to Italy. And uh, we've got a number of Italian uh, uh, tours there. And uh, a couple of days ago, we did Italian cities in one evening, Venice, Florence, and Rome. Tomorrow, I will be featuring small town and rural and countryside Italy, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I just love talking about Italy, and you can see here our schedule. Right now, Saturday, we're with Robin in Switzerland. Tomorrow, David Torti is waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning in Orvieto in Italy to join us as we do Italian countryside. Monday, we have a Monday night travel festival uh, talk, and that's going to be my goofy history of our tour company way back from my vagabond days. Then we go to Portugal and to Scotland and on and on. I want to remind you, we've got a lot of guides that would love to help you on your travels. And if you want to know more about all of the things that are available, I would highly recommend checking out our website. And we're going to go to your questions in just a moment. But right now, I just want to remind you, if you go to ricksteves.com, you've got a world of information here. I was just talking with some friends and they're going to Wales and they were asking me where they should go to Wales in Wales. And I said, well, the first place you should go is ricksteves.com. Because if you go to ricksteves.com, you can sign, click right here, watch, read, and listen. And you get all of our TV shows. You get all of our lectures. You get Rick Steves Audio Europe. You get our radio interviews. You get travel articles and so on. There are 130 different TV shows covering Europe, and all of them are available just a click away if you would like to enjoy that. Switzerland, I've got a whole hour-long special on the Alps. That might be just a cup of tea for you in your travel planning. So we've got lots going on right here at ricksteves.com. All right. Hey, I am I think it's time right now, high time for us to go back to Julianne and uh, let's answer a few questions. Julianne, are you there? Yes. Well, I have to say the enthusiasm both of you have for Switzerland is just contagious. It was so fun watching you both just talk about this beautiful place. <laughs> I, you know, I, Robin, I got a second that. It's so fun to talk to you, Robin, because you're so intimate with the Italy pro or the uh, Switzerland program because you put a lot of time and energy into designing that itinerary, actually traveling around and, and finding the best family to visit if you want to learn about the cheese and, and the best musician to invite to dinner if you want to learn about the Alphorn. Yeah, and I, it took me a while to realize this, but you know, when you go to France, you go to Italy, you've got the Vatican, you've got the Louvre as the attraction. But when you go to Switzerland, Switzerland is the attraction. And with that, it just opens so many opportunities and options for you. You can't go wrong. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Robin. And uh, Juliana, I bet we have some questions for Robin. Yes, that actually, Robin, was kind of my first question. As um, when you visit other places, there's often the museums are such a great site to go see. And in Switzerland, is there really much art or museums that you want to go see when you're there? Or like you, know, you said, is it just the place? No, there really are some great museums in Lucerne. You've got the Modern Art Museum. You've got the Paul Klee Museum outside of Bern. You and you've got the Art Brut Museum in Lausanne. You could you could hop your way through museums in each place. I think the 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 attraction though for most people is to get out in nature. Yep. 
I would, I would having, agree. If you're, if you're going elsewhere, I mean, to be honest, you'd want to give your extra museum going time to London and Paris and, and Florence. If you have a specialty interest, Paul Clay, that's the best Paul Clay collection in Europe by far. Uh, and the one Robin mentioned in Lausanne, uh, the, the Brut Art Museum is art uh, done by people who were actually locked up because they were considered criminally insane. And they were uh, idiot savants and they created amazing art and there's no museum like it. And when you were in Lausanne, that's where Robin showed us the Olympics Museum. You could spend a couple of hours visiting that amazing um, uh, Brut Art Museum, B-R-U-T. And Robin, you mentioned in Lausanne how it's important to know a couple words of French, like bonjour, when you enter into a store. Anne was wondering, what is the most useful language to speak in Switzerland? German. German would be, especially where most tourists go, you're going to be in the German speaking area. And really, most people in Switzerland also speak English. Yes. David's wondering, Switzerland can be a more expensive place to travel. Do you have some top budget tips for traveling here? Rick, do you want me to take that or do you have some good tips yourself? I just can think of four letters. C-O-O-P. <laughs> Co-op, the grocery store. I was going to say the same thing. A way that you can really save money in Switzerland is to pack a picnic and to go into the grocery store. And also that just ex exposes you to the local things. We didn't get to talk, Rick, about Ravella or mm. about some fun things that you can find in the grocery store. Ravella is the Swiss national drink. It's called a soda, if you believe it. I'm still on the fence about it, but, you know, they swear by it. Right. That's true. Um, remember, Switzerland is expensive in a lot of ways, but the great joy of Switzerland is hiking. And as I mentioned to Robin and everybody, um, I spent a week in Switzerland just on vacation. And every night uh, we spent um, an average of $100 for, uh, uh, well, it was $200 for two people traveling together for the hotel and for dinner and breakfast, $100 each. And after that, we didn't take any lifts, we hiked everywhere. And even if you did take a few lifts, it wouldn't add up to much. So you've got $100 a night for your hotel and your bed if you're staying in, in rustic places. And you got your cost of groceries. And if the cost of groceries are double in Switzerland what they are here, it's still a cheap meal. But I would, many times, Robin, I would spread out my picnic just feeling so proud about how good it is and how hardy it was and how cheap it was. I'd take a photograph and I'd say, two lunches for, for $14 and uh, including all of the, 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 the beautiful chocolate to have for dessert. <laughs> Well, and that's what you see Swiss people, Swiss families doing that too. They they get their backpacks out at the top of the mountain and they take out their own uh, pack sack lunches. So it's a very local thing to do. I do have to say also though, um, a very important thing to think about in Switzerland is the Swift family pass. So if you are traveling as an adult and you have a Switzerland travel pass and you're traveling with kids six to 16 years old, when you buy your Switzerland travel pass, you can request the family card for your children and it's free so with one paying adult you get a child six to 16 and then any kind of travel you do on the rails is free sounds like we're listening to somebody who's done a little research for one of them rick steve's guidebooks this is the kind of information we have to organize so our <laughs> travelers can learn from our experience and enjoy maximum travel thrills for every dollar and rick i'm kind of surprised we didn't see any pictures of your picnics while you're hiking you love to share those pictures of your sandwich and your apple <laughs> you know it's so funny you say that because literally 10 minutes before showtime i ran into my other slideshow and i grabbed those three shots that that i i just tossed in about those hikes because i had such a good time in hiking and i almost grabbed one of those hikes or one of those picnics because i bring a little one of my little um fun little extras, my little guilty pleasures is to bring a tiny tablecloth. <laughs> I love to have a, a tablecloth to give my 8,000 foot high picnic lunch a little elegance. And uh, I actually, Rob and I traveled with a Swiss army knife for the first time since before terrorism. We used to sell a lot of Swiss army knives until 9-11. And uh, <laughs> my Swiss army knife, I had to check a bag because I had my walking sticks. And if you check a bag, you can bring mm -hmm. you can bring a, a whole collection of knives, you know, uh, you just can't carry it onto the airplane. So I thought I'm checking a bag because of my stupid walking sticks. I'm going to toss in my Swiss Army knife. It was great to have a Swiss oh, Army Rick, knife. Oh, Rick, I always bring my Victorian Knox knife. You can get these in any of the co-ops. You can get them in any of the souvenir stores. They're like five or six Swiss francs, and then you have it with you for your picnics. There you go. And it, it really, uh, it, it, it gives you a little 
civility when you're ripping through all that food uh, with your uh, with your great view. I'll remember that. You can get a cheap knife, a Victorinox knife at co-op. And I love the idea of having a little tablecloth because the mountains are so grand. It's as yeah. if you're respecting them with a little the tablecloth. <laughs> More formal. <setting. laughs> Speaking of hiking, Maria, well, we have quite a few hiking questions. But Maria is wondering, what is the best time of year, would you say, to um, take a trip to go hiking in Switzerland? Or best I think months? You can go, yeah, I think you can go really any time. I mean, in the winter, you're going you're gonna to encounter snow, but you can also encounter snow in July. Um, it's, it's just, you will have more daylight if you go in the, in the summer months and the best chance of weather. Um, yeah, I don't think there's really a bad time to go. Mm -hmm. I agree. And for both of you, do you have a most memorable experience from hikes in Switzerland? Hmm. I think I do. Go first, Robin, because I'm just getting something up here. Oh, well, my, mine is not from a hike because I, I cheated and I took the lift up to the top of the Schiltorn. And the Schiltorn Mountain is famous for the James Bond 007 on Her Majesty's uh, Secret Service movie. And we I was invited to go to an anniversary party there at the top at Pease Gloria. And I got to meet George Lazenby. We were talking about this earlier. So that's probably my, my uh, favorite Swiss mountain uh, memory. Not hiking, wow. but pretty good one. That sounds really good. Hey, um, you know, I, I just had to get something for you. Um, can I <laughs> it's a big, big shot. Let's see. Can I can I do that? Let me just see if I can get this. Um, I'll share. I'll share. I'll share and I'll share. Shoot, are you seeing my picnic? We are not. Wow. There you are. Oh, there we go. There's my picnic. <laughs> Look at that. That's a nice meal. I'll tell you, the carrot tastes really good at 8,000 feet. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a tablecloth. Such a simple meal, but when you've hiked all morning, it's very, very nice. All right. More questions. Well, Rick, do you have a favorite, just one memory of hiking in the Swiss Alps? Yeah. One day I, I hiked up, and in the old days, we would bring a plastic garbage bag with us so we could sit on it and um, sl slide down the mountain on the ice fields. It was the thing we did. I hiked way up to the Schiltorn, and uh, I was going to then gonna enjoy the, the ride back down. I sat on my garbage bag, holding it, and boom, boom, boom. And then I got going out of control because it was so steep and so icy. And I realized I can't stop myself. And I also realized... There is a very gnarly cliff ahead of me, and I didn't know what would happen if I didn't stop. And I had to find a way to stop. And I realized at all cost to save my life, I've got to stop. And I ground my hands into the ice like a like sort of like Fred Flintstone putting on the brakes, if you can imagine that. And my hands went through first, second, third degree burn just as fast as you could say that. And it was just and I stopped myself and I was really bloody. My butt was bloody too, and I didn't die. And I was very thankful. And I went, made my way to the lift. I took the lift back down into the valley, into Mir, and I went to the doctor, and he just said, "You stupid tourists." <laughs> and he kind of washed me cursory, and he sprayed something on it, but it was still there was little rocks in my hand. And he said, "Okay, don't do that again, you dumb tourist." And uh, that was a good lesson for me. So. You gain an appreciation for the Alps. That's what I would say. The Alps are dangerous. You got to take them seriously. When you hear all of these worry wart warnings, those are for real. People die all the time in the Alps. I was just talking to the ambassador of Switzerland yesterday, literally, and she reminded me one of the big chores she had was dealing with serious injuries and deaths from people that were frolicking in the Alps. So it's all great, but you do have to take it seriously and be smart. I know the number. Yeah. I know. I know the uh, emergency number to get a helicopter evacuation. Fourteen, fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> All, Ollie told me that when I left on our hike. Uh, he said, "If you need a Swiss helicopter to emergency evacuate, it'll be expensive, but you dial one four one four." I might say though, Robin, see if you agree that, and Rick too, that if you stay on trail, they have really well maintained trails, and pay attention to signs. Then it's a nice, smooth sailing, oh, great yeah. experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just don't take a garbage bag and slide down an ice field <laughs> near a cliff. <laughs> Words of wisdom. Yes. Well, I love being introduced to Bups. Is that his name today? Bups. The Alphorn player? Yes. And he just seems like quite a character. But Rick, Susan was wondering, did you yodel when you were with Bups when you were there? I have yodeled in Switzerland because on a very early tour when we were driving minibuses, generally more women took the tour than men because men could just slum around Europe and not be endangered. And women wanted to have the safety of numbers. So I'd have eight women on my minibus and I'd be the tour guide. And we would pick up hitchhikers if the ladies wanted, if they liked the guy. And we saw this good looking guy hitchhiking in, uh, in Switzerland. And we asked him if he wanted to, uh, he asked us if he could give us, if we give him a ride. And, and I said, well, everybody said, sure, let's set him on. And I said, but you got to teach us how to yodel. <laughs> and he taught us how to yodel. And I've got a slide of this yodeling from back in 1980 or something. And on Monday, I'm, it's part of my uh, talk on Monday, I'm going to actually yodel. And uh, it's the only time I ever yodel is when I'm giving this talk about the irreverent history of Rick Steves Europe. So sorry to tease you, but if you want to hear me yodel, and I'm pretty good at it, I'm going to do it. Now I'm committed. I have to do it. It'll be Monday, this coming Monday, um, right here, uh, Monday the 16th. Well, something to look forward to, for sure. It is quite a treat to hear. Or Rick something yodel. to avoid. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> people will come <laughs> with that threat. Well, we have time for just one more question. And Robin, maybe you can answer first and then Rick. And just kind of setting the scene, you're alone in the Swiss Alps. You're in the middle or towards the end of a hike. And you're just looking out over the scenery. And what are kind of the thoughts that are going through your head? Um. I think all of my thoughts evaporate. I, I feel so at one with nature that I just feel euphoria. I feel uplifted. I feel wow. And I know Rick said, says this in, I don't know, his show or the books. It's if heaven isn't what it's cracked up to be, send me back to Gimmewald. And that's, that's how I feel. That is so beautiful. I, I love to be on a ridge and, you know, um, I'm, I'm a Lutheran and Lutherans are famously uh, unemotional in their worship style. And uh, a lot of people, you know, they go like all this kind of stuff. And when I'm on a ridge, even though I'm a Lutheran, I can go like that because people ask me, what's the greatest cathedral in Europe? And I would say a ridge high in the Alps. That's where you just feel so close to heaven, so close to God and to be there and to be healthy and to see the beautiful environment spreading all around you, to think of the, the culture, the terroir, the hard work, the love, the pride, the children, the moms and the dads and the grandmas, the wars and the peace and the progress and the tourism. It's all mixed in together and you're right there on top of it all, celebrating it, able to experience it. It's a beautiful thing, you know. And we get to share that with people in our travels. <laughs> so, hey, Robin, thank you so much. It was a delight to share um, your passion for Switzerland. And we are so thankful for everybody who's joining us. And want to remind you, every night between now and January 30th, we're going to meet right here. And we're going to celebrate every corner of Europe by the time we're done. And on January 30th, we have a grand finale. So thanks a lot. Happy travels. And again, we'll see you soon, we hope. Good night, Robin. Bye. Good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Good night, Robin. Good night, everyone. See you tomorrow night. <laughs>